let's uh, get the show going here. Um, thank you all to come uh, for the for our second uh, actual virtual meeting via GoTo meeting here in May. Um, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, first item up is agenda review. Um, are there any items that any board members would wish to rearrange on the agenda this evening? All right, seeing none, then we're going to hop right into legislative update, and I will turn it over to both uh, Sue and Sandra, and uh, not sure which one's going first. That'd be me. Hi, everyone. Sue. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry, Sandra. I was just going to give a, a quick little intro, and then I'll, I'm going to hand it over to you. Perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna provide an update on the 19 districts without budgets and current legislative proposals to address those districts. Sandra is going to provide an update on other legislative activity, including bills addressing temporary municipal tax rate provisions, temporary workers' compensation changes, Act 173 delay, lead testing extension, and extension of a refund upon sale provision that is related to school construction aid. So I'm gonna ask Sandra to go first and then I will finish up with the update with about the 19 districts without budgets. So go ahead, Sandra. Great, thank you. So I thought first I would just start by um, letting you know what's happening um, and what will be happening over the next few weeks in the legislature. So right now, committees continue to address the COVID-19 related issues. The money committees are focused on making changes to the current year's budget and um, on the need to close out FY20 in as balanced a way as possible before developing the quarter one of FY21 budget. Discussions about how to spend the federal emergency response funding has begun. Um, however, there are a lot of restrictions on the use of those funds and many sectors vying for a piece of the pie. Um, when the close of FY20 is final and FY21 quarter one, budget is developed, the General Assembly will recess until August, and then they'll return for about four to five weeks and develop the budget for quarters two, three, and four of FY21. So that's the plan as of we're hearing right now. Um, our legislative analyst, Kara Zimmerman, has been working considerably less hours um, since the emergency began, and we've reached out to her and she has expressed availability to help us pick the work back up in the fall when that resumes. This week, um, the President of the Senate, Tim Ash, stated that they will now begin discussion, discussing any of the remaining must-have, he called it, committee bills that are not related to COVID-19 um, starting tomorrow. And they'll take up a few bills at a time. The chair of the Senate um, Education Committee, uh, which is Senator Baruth, has prioritized the following, S-226, which is the statewide health care bargaining, and S-166, which is State Board of Education Authorities and Duties. And he also has been working closely with the chair of the House Education Committee, um, that's Kate Webb, who has prioritized uh, the following, the Act 173 delay, the lead testing extension, those two I'm gonna talk a little bit more about in just a minute, and a bill that was being worked on pre prior to the emergency, which is 8209 related to school construction. Um, and the, la the last version of H209 appropriates $1.5 million um, to have an assessment done of all school properties and to start to prioritize where to resume construction at a statewide um, view and perspective. Right now, that bill is sitting in House Ways and Means. So they've begun to talk about that. The Act 173 delay is pretty simple it's just a straight one year delay given all that schools are going to be facing when we return hopefully when we return to school in the fall they felt like um, schools were going to need another year to be able to just settle into our new reality before taking on another huge piece of um, legislation so that proposal um, house appropriations discussed it because there's uh, additional money needed for another year of meetings but they voted it out of committee on monday the lead testing extension is because uh, the Department of Health has been unable to complete all of the testing in all the schools and child care programs, which was required to be done by December 31 of 2020. And they've asked for an extension to um, December 31st of 2021. Questions before I move on to municipal tax provision? I just wanted to shout out or put a hand up. Otherwise, I'll keep going. 
Okay, looks all right. So S344 addresses temporary municipal tax rate provisions by giving town select boards and other local legislative bodies the ability to delay due dates for state property taxes, which fund pre-K to 12 education. The bill would be in, in effect for calendar year 2020 and applies only to property taxes collected by the municipality from taxpayers. The bill passed both the House and the Senate. And then another um, bill relating to municipalities is H947. And that bill proposes um, to provide a legislative body of a municipal corporation with a temporary authority to adopt the municipal tax rate for the next fiscal year, provided that the municipality has not yet held an annual or special meeting to adopt the municipal tax rate. The bill passed out of House and passed out of the Senate government operations um, today. So that's moving along as well. That's it for municipalities. And then um, for workers comp, S342 passed in the Senate and has been messaged to the House, though the House has not taken any action on the bill. Um, and this bill would allow for temporary workers compensation provision for frontline workers if they contract the COVID virus on the job. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about is the extension of sunset. Um, of a repeal related to school construction. So currently 16 VSA 3448 section B says that if a school district um, has received state aid construction for a project and then the building is sold, the school district shall refund to the state a percentage of the sale price equal to the percentage of the construction aid that was received. So if the original award was 30% of the project, then the school district would have to refund the state 30% of the sale price. Because of Act 46, um, this component of statute was repealed and it has been from um, July of 2016 until July 1st of 2020. Because that date is coming up, that's it's going to be sunsetted, there is an ask right now for a year extension on that repeal. So that's where we are. Any uh, questions for Sandra? Um, this is Dan. I, you had said that uh, select boards would be able to set a tax rate for the coming year or a budget. I'm not sure. Is that limited to 100% of the current year or is there a limit on that? Mm -hmm. Or what is the deal with that? I haven't heard them talk specifically about any kind of limitation. Have you, Sue? Unlike, unlike no, school board budgets, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Neil? This is, oh, sorry. This is Laurie Childers. I just wanted to know, was Acts 173, did they just postpone the um, implementation to one year? Yes. Uh, go ahead, Don. Uh, while we have Sandra, and I wasn't quick enough when you opened the meeting, uh, but Sandra, sometime before we close down tonight, can you take a, just a couple of minutes to update everybody on where we are with resolutions? I know the resolution committee uh, has set their schedule. Uh, I guess as the person who probably will chair in that meeting, I'd like to ask everybody to start uh, shaking the trees in your region to make sure we are getting resolutions and people know that we are going to act on resolutions, even though uh, the virus has shut down a lot of things. So. I just, uh, I'm done. Yep. Okay, Don, I just wanted to let you know that last week we sent out a reminder to everyone about resolutions and on the 15th, we'll be sending out another reminder to everyone, letting them know um, how it works and where the form is, a link to the form to yeah. submit one, just so that you know. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. I had seen that. I just know that personal contact sometimes uh, by regional reps has some has some impact. Thank you. Okay. Hi, this is Lori Childers again. Sorry, Carrie, when did that email go out? Because I didn't see it. And I maybe it, I just want to make sure I'm. I can get the date for you while we're on. All right, I'm not thanks. sure what the date was. Yep. Any other questions for Sandra this evening? Colleen? I found ahead. it, Carrie. It was April 2nd. Thank you. Thank you.
I just had a question about the email that went out. Did it go to all board members or board chairs? Because I must have skimmed through it on my email as well. All board members. I'll get you guys the date. Just one second. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I missed it. All right. Uh, looks like most of the questions are not for Sandra. Um, <laughs> so uh, that means that you did an excellent job of covering the material. Great. <laughs> I guess I'll turn it back over to Sue. Did you have anything else to add on this one? Yes, I will uh, cover the 19 districts without budgets. So if you remember at your April meeting, the board discussed the 19 districts without budgets. Those are um, some of them had their budgets defeated on town meeting day and others have not voted yet um, because they had a later voting date for their budget. Um, and at that April uh, VSBA board meeting, you approved an approach that would provide the districts with spending authority based on FY 2020 education spending plus an inflator and the ability to continue to hold a vote on the board's proposed budget. So I included in your board packet for this meeting, the written testimony that I presented to the House Education and House Ways and Means Committees on April 17th. Those committees did not favor the Senate Education Committee's approach, which is also in your packet, which provided the districts with level um, spending authority for FY 2021 based on their FY 2020 education spending without an inflator. The, the uh, House Ways and Means and House Education Committees preferred an approach that would defer to school boards to approve a budget and that differentiates between those districts whose budgets were defeated on town meeting day and those that have yet to hold a vote. And uh, I would refer you to the most recent bill developed by the House Education Committee, which is also in your packet and along with a uh, sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Current law is a bridge which provides borrowing authority if a budget is not approved by June 30th. It allows 87% of um, most recently approved school budget to be borrowed by the school board um, until a budget vote is approved. So the legislature is currently operating under a system that requires bills to originate in the Senate and um, due to the disagreement between the House and the Senate on how to approach this issue of the districts without budgets, there hasn't been any progress on a solution to date. Earlier this afternoon, Jeff Francis and I met with the superintendents and school board chairs of the 19 districts to update them on the current proposals in play, provide information on when votes are scheduled in each of their districts um, based on the survey that was sent out to all of them yesterday and discuss next steps. And I should add, I believe this was either the third or fourth Zoom meeting we've had with them. So we're, we're keeping in close contact with them and um, making sure that we are um, taking all of their concerns into account. We're working to put the 19 districts on equal footing with the rest of the districts in the state so that they are not disproportionately affected by any statewide measures directed at school districts due to COVID-19. Um, I believe the motion passed at the last board meeting includes enough flexibility to allow me to continue to work with the affected districts toward a resolution that they can all support. Uh, I, it may be very difficult to get any kind of an inflator, but uh, we're still working on the issue. Um, however, if there's any further direction the board would like to provide, please feel free to do so. Um, I've gotten a lot of input from the districts and, uh, that are affected and uh, that's been very, very helpful. And I will be testifying on Friday in the House Education Committee on this topic, um, probably submitting joint testimony with uh, the Superintendents Association because uh, we've, the school board chairs and the superintendents have been working very closely together on the topic. So that's the end of my report on the 19 districts. Are there any questions? Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. What are the um, the superintendents of the districts telling you um, they'd be okay with considering the lack of um, move movement from the Senate? Uh, Mark, it really it does vary from district to district. Uh, there are some. There are a few that are very the budgets they were going to propose are 
very, very close to the FY 2020 spending um, because they had already made a lot of cuts or they had some operational changes. And so those ones are pretty good with um, FY 2020. There are others that say we'd have to have, you know, two or $3 million in cuts. But overall, I think they've been moving closer to that direction um, because they're just getting more and more concerned about um, whether they can pass a budget in this economic climate. They all are scheduling votes, though. I mean, that most of them have votes scheduled um, either at the very end of May or sometime in June. So they are definitely scheduling votes and trying to get their budgets passed. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so this is Clarence. Um, would the legislature not reconvening in August, are they not going to work on fixing the ed fund now, or are they just putting that off till in August? And have they set the date for the August thing? Are they going to be in session over the primary or before or after, or, or has that even come up as a topic? I haven't heard the specific date they're coming back in August. Um, I'm not sure if Sandra may have heard a specific date, but I have not heard a specific date. Um, I believe they're going to be addressing, uh, and the next item on our agenda is education fund update, and I, I believe they're going to be addressing the education fund before they leave in May um, because they're looking at addressing the the state um, budget overall uh, in phases. So in May, they're going to be the, doing the first quarter and then they're going to be doing the rest later on. But I think they've determined that they cannot really do that with the Ed Fund. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about our, uh, our, our 19 districts? When they finish with that one, I can give you an update on the resolution emails that have gone out and that will go out. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions related to those districts. So Carrie, it's all yours. Okay. The resolution um, communications timeline is our first email went out April 2nd. We have the next one coming out May 15th and then June 15th, June 23rd and June 30th. Thank you for that. So uh, this is Lori Childers. I'm sorry, my video's off because it slows down if I have it on. Two things. Can we make the um, the subject line of that resolution reminder something more exciting, like help, help hmm, model, nah, you know, do some, create the VSBA to the great association that it is? Because I missed it. I'm on the board and I missed the email. Um, and sounded like one other, Colleen, maybe. Um, and uh, now that I've said all that, I forgot what the heck the other thing was. So I'm going to turn off. I'll be back in a minute. If Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sure. We'll, we'll see if we can have uh, a very eye-popping subject line for that, uh, for that email. Any other questions related to the resolutions before we... Uh, I'm going to piggyback off of Clarence's segue to get us into the Ed Fund discussion. All right, I believe the floor is yours again, Sue. Okay, thank you. So this is the Ed Fund update, which can be broken down basically into into two sections: FY 2020, which is the fiscal year we are currently in, and FY 2021, which is the fiscal year that begins on July 1. For FY 2020, the legislature has been steadily working toward a resolution, and uh, they seem to be close to resolving that without having any major impact on on school districts. And uh, the reason the reason for that is because it was just so close to the end of the um, fiscal year. Um, so the bigger issue really is FY 2021, where there is an anticipated hole in the Ed Fund of 166. $167 million. This number, of course, is a forecast, changes regularly, but um, it is extremely large and daunting. Yesterday, the House Ways and Means Committee met on this topic, 
and they seem to agree on an approach that would include setting normal education property tax rates for FY 2021 based on voter approved education spending and the January revenue forecast. Prior to COVID-19, the Ed Fund had a surplus and the budgets passed on town meeting day came in slightly lower than forecasted in the December one letter. So based on that, um, th they've decided they don't want to um, balance the Ed Fund on the backs of property taxpayers. They're gonna figure out some other ways to do that. Um, so the, the, what they're, the bill that they're looking at right now um, proposes a three cent increase in the average homestead property tax rate and a three cent increase in the non-homestead property tax rate. Um, if they had required property taxpayers to fill the hole in the Ed Fund, the increase would have been um, in excess of 20 cents. So the other ways that are being considered to address the hole in the Ed Fund, um, there's really they're they're really brainstorming now what to do and um, trying to get a handle on the federal funds that are coming in and how those can be used. Um, the federal funds are not allowed to be used just to fill in um, lost state revenues, so they have to be a little creative. Um, so some of the things they're looking at is possibly distributing Vermont's 27 to 28 million dollar share of the federal education emergency relief fund money to supervisor unions um, after June 30th and then subtracting each school district's allocation from its FY 2021 education spending. They're also looking at the possibility of um, appropriating a portion of the $1.25 billion that Vermont is going to be receiving from the Coronavirus Relief Fund to an emergency relief fund for Vermont schools to be administered by AOE. And then what the, this all is like a pieces of a puzzle, they would reduce the education payment to school districts via yet to be determined uniform percentage and then allow every school district to apply to AOE for a grant to cover its spending that is eligible for coronavirus relief up to the amount of the education payment that had been reduced. So they're trying to make school districts whole in that way, but going through that process. Um, also under consideration are um, various increases to consumption taxes. And I think that there is overall a um, recognition that the large hole in the ed fund is not going to be solved with one uh, one way it's going to have to be several different pieces of the puzzle um, in order to fill that hole um, so that that's just um, the approach that I heard spoken about uh, yesterday in the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, right before I got on this meeting, uh, I received an email from the assistant for the House Ways and Means Committee inviting me to join their meeting tomorrow, not necessarily to testify, but to be in the Zoom meeting in case uh, there was any Thing that I wanted to raise or uh, or questions or perhaps if they have questions for me. So that is the update on um, the education fund. It's it's definitely a uh, a hot topic in the legislature um, and one that is evolving daily uh, as more information becomes known about the the federal funds, especially. Are there any questions on the education fund update? Uh, Colleen? Have there uh, been any discussions related to um, things such as shortening the school year, um, providing a waiver, and it would have an effect on contracts for sure, but any any manipulations, any discussion about, uh, you know, instead of, you know, maybe even moving to like 170 days, just even reducing by a couple of days in the calendar? And I'm just curious if anyone's bringing up any uh, ideas related to issues that would have an effect on contracts. I haven't heard any 
proposals like that in the legislature. Um, we do have a weekly meeting with the Secretary of Education and there was a request um, submitted to him to consider um, allowing schools to end earlier than scheduled so that staff could have two weeks or one week. I think it was one week. Um, there's some places where it could be up to two weeks um, of time to spend planning for the fall term. But that is that doesn't affect contracts because the teachers would still be working. They just wouldn't be teaching. They would be planning for fall. This is Adrian up in, in Mill River. And I know that discussion has gone on in our district and they have been giving approvals for shortened student contact um, with the same provision that, that they would be using it for PD and, and planning purposes. Hasn't been told to any teachers yet though, so. This is uh, um, Michelle. Michelle Braun from Washington Orange and our um, the superintendent of Montpelier Roxbury has been asking for this I know um, for a while because she feels like the um, student learning experience is going to get more and more challenging over the rest of this month. That's Kim did you have a question? I'm not sure that, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, it looks like my, I've got like the wheel of death going on. It looks like my computer's about to crash. So we'll see how long this works. If I drop off, I'll call in on my phone. This is an unnerving sound. Anyway, um, I was curious if I understood correctly, the federal funds, the 27 million might be distributed to districts, but then netted out of what districts are otherwise gonna get um is that like clawback esque am i understanding that correctly well it's it should be revenue neutral because they are um they would be subtracting the exact amount that they you are receiving in the federal funds um but it's still to be determined whether it would be problematic to do that because um, there may be expenses that districts have in FY20 that they want to um, cover some of those funds, use some of those funds to cover. Sue? Oh. Sorry, this uh, is Nancy. I have a question. Can you go hear ahead, me? Nancy. Okay. Yes, yes. All right, so I have to leave this meeting early because I have to go into our school board meeting here in Hartford. So I just, and I usually give them a, an update on what we've been talking about. So my question is, when you were talking about that, they're talking about maybe shortening the student year for this year, I should not say anything about that? Well, that's not something that the legislature's talking about. It's something that um, a, a group of the associations that meet with the secretary every week have asked him to consider doing. All right, so once again, I should not mention that, or is it okay to mention that? You, it's certainly I don't want okay to, to mention it. I don't know, I wouldn't say that it's a, it, it's not a done deal, it's just been requested right. of him. Okay, all right, maybe I just won't mention it then. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is Clarence. Um, in our uh, supervisory union, we applied for the waiver from the, ag <coughs> excuse me, from the agency. And we just got word today that he's not going to approve it. He'll uh, let us adjust for the snow days we had, but he wouldn't adjust our calendar for two extra days that we asked for. So that may be the policy that's coming out that you aren't going to get those waivers you're asking for. Thanks, Clarence. Jim, did you have something or? Okay, Jim's good. Any other, uh, go ahead, Colleen. Uh, so, my my uh, question is more about um, shortening the number of not just the student teacher contact days, but actually finding some leverage to shorten contract uh, duration for personnel. 
I, cause I, you know, quite frankly, I don't know how we're going to be able to do it without having less payroll going out the door, unless there's this huge infusion of federal money. And, you know, everybody, I think everyone's interested in maintaining a system so that when we're back up and running, we can, uh, haven't lost a lot of ground, but even like reducing a week or of the teacher contract days, um, and it would it might be you know legally challenging to do it, but there are also a lot of uh, contracts that are in the middle of being negotiated or on hold right now. So. Uh, you know, is there a financial exigency determination that can come from the state that allows some leverage with changing the financial picture without people losing their jobs, but, you know, maybe there's something that has to go away, and is it the number of teacher days or, or something? Um, but I, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. I think people need to kind of brainstorm and explore all sorts of different ideas, and I would hope that some kind of opportunity to have some determination about financial exigency that allows reducing the number of contract days without destroying the system. Yeah, and Sue, can I just uh, piggyback off of Colleen's comments? Because I think the one thing that strikes me is that there doesn't seem, it seems so far that the discussion has been around um, replacing revenue rather than addressing expenses. Um, and is that your sense that you're getting from the discussions that are going on in the legislature at the moment? Yes, I would say that's that's true. Um, I have been in some discussions not involving the legislature that tend more on the to what you're to the other side. But yes. Yeah, and so while I I can certainly understand and sympathize with the point that Colleen is making, I wonder if it's a bit. Um, premature, Colleen, to be entertaining it, local level decisions like that without some state level um, action or guidance, because I wouldn't want, you know, a certain school district to to gut something only to find out later on that that actually might not have been necessary. I, I totally agree. I would rather that those kinds of discussions stay away from the local and that there's guidance from the state. But I think that, you know, the state needs to help us figure a way out of this box. And, you know, the same discussions are happening in higher ed right now as well. It's not just the P12 system. So, uh, I don't know. Yeah, just a thought. and at the same time, the, the um, overall, the state, um, the whole for the state, including the general fund, the transportation fund, and the education fund is, you know, over $400 million. I can't remember the exact amount, but so they're dealing with a lot they're not just dealing with the ed fund, they're dealing with all the other funds as well. But again, yeah. on the on the ed fund shortfall, you know, one, one thing to kind of, I've been trying to make the point to people that the shortfall is really all associated with the nature of funding that the legislature provided to the ed fund, which is those consumption taxes. You know, that's, it's, you know, it's sales and use, purchase and use, meals and rooms is, you know, it has been cut off at the knees. And what does that really have to do with education? So it's a it's a challenge for the state. It's just the, you know, to expect the the education system to adjust their budgets for a shortfall in sales tax um, is more a comment on the 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 nature of funding for the ed fund is not logical more so than you know it it being something that we really should be adjusting for because it's a it ties into education it's just a fundamental sort of issue so you know hopefully they'll look at it as as neil said as a revenue issue you know re revenue replacement but there's no assurance of that but it's a good case to make <laughs> thanks for that point um any other questions related to uh, the education fund. Yes, uh, Neil, this is Clarence. I, I wonder, the scheme that they're proposing, I'm going to deem it a scheme of giving it to the agency and letting supervisory unions apply for it as a grant to get back what they've cut out. Uh, is there 
anything is that written in a bill yet and is that going to be a guarantee that we can get it back through the grant or will that be at the at the pleasure of the agency whether we get it or not it's not written in a bill yet clarence and um it wouldn't be as i understand it the the restrictions that are on those federal funds um would make it it wouldn't just be an automatic you would have to show a relation to COVID 19. so that is a concern because uh, i'm not sure that there would be enough COVID-19 related um, expenses to make it even. <laughs> so that, that is definitely a concern. Although when, when you start thinking about all the ramifications of COVID-19, you can certainly tie a lot of things to it. But would, the, would then, to the extent that the Agency of Education didn't send that, those funds directly back to the districts, would it then be used to reduce, or would it would any balance <clears throat> go directly to the ed fund to, to reduce the impact on the ed fund? Oh, I don't know, that hasn't, that, that's a great idea. I haven't heard that yet because it's not, it's really just discussion. So, um, but uh, I'm, I'm taking notes on all of this. So I'm writing that down, Jim. Okay. One, one other just little thing I was curious about is you mentioned 27 to 28 million. And I think, you know, earlier they were talking more like 30, 31 million that was supposed to be coming to the districts. Yes. Well, the, the that's the total amount coming in. The agency of education is allowed to keep 10% of it. And then the rest is going out to the districts. I'm still going to call that a scheme. I'm sorry. Well, that particular part of it is is uh, just the way that the federal law is written. The agency doesn't have to keep 10%, but they are allowed to keep up to 10%. And um, I think from all that we have seen so far, they intend to keep that 10%. Um, the way that they're going to use it, I believe, um, is it has to. It's going to be related to helping districts that are um, most severely affected by COVID-19. And Sue, they're not calling this Title One funding, right? Funds. No, it's not Title One funding, but it's being distributed to the districts in the same manner as Title One funds are distributed. But it doesn't have the Title One restrictions on it I think just as a general comment I think you know while Clarence concerned about you know schemes and stuff honestly the way the cares act was written you know the the funds coming out of that you know the the restrictions on it really requires some creep you know like Sue said some real creativity to figure out how to actually be able to use them so I think you need some schemes to you know, otherwise we're going to be returning a whole lot of that, you know, one and a quarter billion dollars to the to the to the feds. And Sue, if I I'm can just concerned that in in later years when they come back to audit, it, we'll wind up having to return it anyways. Uh, that shouldn't happen. But if it's like the title money that you can't supplant uh, a salary with it, you've got to add on personnel. That's kind of counterproductive in this in this area. I, I agree. They're going to have to be some kind of way of creativity to get to use it. But if we wind up getting audited and have to pay it back in out years, that's really not going to be too big a deal or too good a deal. So, so, ahead, this, is, this is Dan. I have a question about the three cents that would be added to the non-resident tax uh, rate uh did they give any indications of how much money that raises what is it now about a dollar fifty something right uh 159 i think now and it would go up to 162 i believe and a, a net amount or i can find that somehow i just wondered if you knew that i don't have that off the top of my head dan but we could um get that for you i believe we can get it for you Great, thanks. 
Any other uh, questions on the Ed Fund before we uh, move along? All right. Um, so most of you know, because uh, we had gotten together just uh, last week, uh, that the VSBA was awarded the Payment Protection um, Program. And so we just wanted to have a brief update on the status of that. Yes. Yeah, so the Paycheck Protection Program loan documents were executed on Friday, May 8th, after the board meeting. The PPP funds were deposited into VSBA's account yesterday, May 12th. I spoke yesterday with VSBA's accountant to see if she had any recommendations for tracking the use of the funds. She provided Carrie with information about um, recommended QuickBooks settings and classes to use in QuickBooks. And the first expenditure of the funds will be this week for payroll. And we'll provide you with an update at the June meeting regarding the uses and status of the PPP funds. Would you like me to, are, are there any questions on PPP funds? Neil, would you like me to move on to COVID-19 information? Yes, please. Okay. We wanted to let you can know that me? on. Yes. Uh, we can, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I had, anyway, I tried to get back in and uh, it says the meeting's full. We have so many people. Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I, since I got caught off, I wanted to make a statement about um, two things with uh, going back to the legislature. Um, grant management by the AOE who cannot get our business managers the appropriate information in a timely manner would not be a good additional task to take on for them. It would really be better if they focused on what they're already doing and doing that better and wondered if there was any way we might gently communicate that um, through this process. And the other thing I wanted to say was um, at, at the uh, webinar the other day, Gov uh, Secretary French said that he did not think that um, schools were open again, will open again under regular normal circumstances until there's a vaccine and that there was going to be a task force that's going to be, that may not be the right word, but some a task force that's going to be um, working during the summer to, to to talk about opening schools and how that and I wondered if the VSBA you know somehow could get a a place on that task force yes that's it. yes we can get a place on the task force and uh, I think that they're actually I think they're really starting to focus on it now or soon rather than on, during the summer um, because there's definitely a lot of work to do. Um, I, I believe the latest that I've heard from the secretary is that the plan is that students would be going back to school in the fall, but it's not going to look uh, like it normally looks. There's going to need to be a lot of adjustments and changes made in order for that to happen. Would you like me to move on to COVID information update, or are there other questions before I do that? I think you can move on, Sue. Okay. Uh, we wanted to let you know that on April 23rd, Brad James of the Agency of Education summarized information from a small sample of school districts. He um, explained how schools are using money differently than they had anticipated, and that each SU and SD is experiencing the effects of COVID-19 differently with some school districts at net zero and others are not yet certain about whether they have spent more or less than budgeted. Special education reimbursement is being analyzed at the Agency of Education and we are waiting on the topic. VSBA held a uh, special webinar on April 30th titled How We're Doing What We're Doing with a panel of three board chairs. <coughs> Attendants who discussed how they are working together during the state of emergency caused by COVID-19. And we had record attendance at this webinar, which was very well received. We'd like to thank all the uh, board chairs and superintendents for taking time out of their busy schedules to be panelists for the webinar. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Sandra, who will provide you with information about the letter to Secretary French signed by several education associations and organizations regarding 
pre-kindergarten continuity of learning, and that letter is in your packet. Perfect, thanks. In the governor's um, directive to close schools, he required schools to make preparations for the continuity of learning for students um, pre-K to grade 12 for the remainder of the school year. Um, subsequently, the Agency of Education issued guidance on April 13th and specified the following regarding pre-kindergarten in, in Vermont. Continuity of learning of pre-K students should be developmentally appropriate and focus on social emotional development. The AOE will provide developmentally appropriate learning resources to the field. School districts should support all resident pre-K students, including those that were served in private programs prior to the COVID-19 crisis. And private programs will continue to receive Act 166 funding regardless of their operational status. So in response to that guidance, I testified along with Chelsea Myers from the Vermont Superintendents Association on April 17th. Um, and then we followed up with Secretary French with the letter that's in your packet. And what we emphasized was that school districts are only staffed to support the needs of the students that attend their own public pre-K programs. And in some cases, districts were now being asked to take on hundreds of new additional students and their families to support a continuity of learning. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, there was no additional funding to take on that additional work. Um, meanwhile, um, all the funding that might have been used to take on that additional work was still being directed to programs, private programs. So we asked for the following recommendations. Um, given the developmental needs of young students and the fiscal and capacity constraints of a mixed delivery system, we were asking for uh, the creation of a central location to provide the continuity uh, central location of resources for continuity of learning for families and students, and um, we provided them with examples from four other states. We asked for communication through school districts to families regarding available resources, and the provision of early childhood special education services and supports would continue from the um, LEAs to the families and children to the greatest extent possible. We asked that public and private providers who have existing relationships with children and families continue to support those children and families and that any Act 166 funds be directed to support that work. And then lastly, we ask that there be um, any development of, of resources be very well coordinated among agencies and all organizations so that the system is seamless and um, effectively functioning on behalf of students and their families. So that was the letter um, that you have in your packet. I have not seen a response, Sue. Have you? No response. No response yet. But I would point out that it would that uh, the letter was assigned by several organizations and including Let's Grow Kids, um, which is um, an organization that that supports the the private providers so it was um it was widely widely supported mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. any uh questions on this for either uh sandra or sue all right seeing none does that uh, move us on to member engagement sue yes okay and I believe a member of that committee was going to uh, report to us this evening. Is that correct? I believe so. I'm just not sure who it is. <laughs> uh, Susan, you are muted. There you go. Great. There we go. Sorry about that. I think um, George was going to make a pitch. George, are you still on the line? I, I am still here. Um, I did try to contact the um, Colchester superintendent. Uh, we've had a little back and forth and looking for uh, some engagement with the member, you know, Two, 
potential members of the new um, region. Uh, and we just haven't connected on that. Um, so other than that, we, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please. Um, I think what we wanted to do was to propose um, some kind of outreach um, where we as members of this board went to um, different districts um, to do some member recruitment for our board and also for the boards in general. Is there anything else, Susan, that I, I'm forgetting? Well, so specifically what we've done, what we did is we looked at the new regional structure to look at when terms are expiring and very different committee members were going to reach out to seated, seated board, BSBA board members as to their intentions to run again to determine whether those seats need to have new bodies filling them. Um, but there are also a couple of irregularities because of the regional changes. Uh, notably, Western Chittenden, both of our current Chittenden County representatives are from what will become Eastern Chittenden. And so uh, committee members were reaching out to both board chairs and or superintendents in some of the Western Chittenden regions, hoping to find some interest there. Uh, and also in the event that there are seats opening because people are not expecting to run again or or so there's that and then there's also one region uh where we have three current representatives because of the rearranging of regions so mark clough's term is coming due and Heather and Judy are both, actually both seats go another year. So there's gonna be some need to figure out how to build the stagger back into some of these districts. But right now the energy is around trying to fill the seats with with new blood. Yes, we, we, had, that we, need it. we had proposed um, offering, especially in the new district, a two-year term to start off and a one-year term. Right, and we just need to verify that the bylaws allow us to be sensible about it um, because I, I believe the definition of the board seat is that it's a two-year term. So in a couple of cases, we'd probably be looking to want to do one one-year seat and one two-year seat just to get the staggers back to, to where they ought to be. Um, that said, there's also a district where both seats are expiring this year, again, because of the new definition of the region. So there's going to be some, some um, specific manipulation once we know which of our members want to run again and, and which ones are, are not going to continue on the BSBA board for whatever reasons. So that was part A. And then part B, the other thing that we talked about with a longer term view was to understand what we're doing well that's engaging members and to understand where our shortcomings are and see how we can address those. And the, the group thought that the best way to approach that, at least initially, would be to do an all-member survey, which I don't believe we've done for the last three years. So we're working on a draft of that. One of the issues that came up was the last survey that I was involved with, which was very specifically about board development topics, uh, went out to what was then close to 1,800 board members, and we got 72 responses, which I think pretty clearly illustrates why we've added member engagement to the strategic plan. Um, and so George had come up with the idea that the VSBA regional reps uh, might actually schedule time into board meetings around their regions and bring paper copies of a survey that members can fill out in the meeting to generate um, higher response rates. As I, and so I'm drafting a, a 
survey now, which the committee hasn't seen yet. I plan to get it out to them by the end of the week. But um, the more I'm thinking about it, I'm not sure that's practical because I think the kinds of information that we're going to want will take longer than a few minutes and will require a little bit more thought. Um, so one of the things that the staff had talked about at our staff retreat when this came up way back in December was finding some way to uh, thank members for participating. The topic, the idea of a Ben and Jerry's coupon came up or something along those lines. And so I think the committee can go back to work um, figuring out how we might approach that also. And the committee is reconvening May 21st, I believe is the date, to move forward with the board recruitment pieces. Maybe we'll have a clearer idea of what's going to happen with regional meetings, um, whether they'll be in person or not, and uh, work uh, address that as well as the survey. Well, Any other just, committee members want to add anything? Yeah, just a note, Susan, we did talk about the length of, of the potential survey. And even if we didn't want to stay there and collect it that night, at least offer it, um, ask for any questions, and perhaps have them send them in when they're mm -hmm. done to the regional rep. And, you know, we could uh, collect more information that way. Thank you. Uh, ahead, this is, um, I have a request, and I don't know if this can work or not, but uh, I sit here surrounded by supervisory unions who have not paid their dues to the VSBA, Wyndham Southeast, Wyndham Northeast. Um, I, I would like to see them included in any surveys that go out there because one of my roles as regional rep, I think, is to try to reincorporate these people back into paying their dues and taking advantage of the VSBA. Uh, so that's my suggestion, if possible, send it to board members whether their SU has paid the dues or not. Uh, that might be really valuable information to get, plus a plus a, a goodwill outreach of some kind. That, that's a great idea, Dan. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why we can't do that. Any other questions for the member engagement committee? Go ahead, Colleen. Um, I'm just wondering about the, the timing of uh, when you're trying to collect surveys um, and what you're going to do with the data, what, you know, how are you going to look at it? And I'm just wondering, is it realistic to think that we might be seeing people face to face and perhaps there's, you know, if the interest is in uh, having people complete a survey and you wanted that uh, engagement and I'm kind of thinking out loud and I'm not, I'm not haven't formulated this in any way but is there perhaps a zoom meeting that you could also invite people to say it's going to be 15 minutes just collect you know have a few questions have qualitative feedback small conversations maybe it's regional maybe it's a few districts at a time I don't know, just kind of thinking about how to, you know, what is the goal? What kind of feedback are you looking for? What are you going to do with the data? Uh, and maybe there are different ways to go about getting it. But in short, short surveys are, are always uh, welcome. That's always the best. I, I agree, Colleen. But I think we're looking for important data, but more of it instead of the um, little bit of return we've had so far. And how do we interpret it? We have to come up with good questions and then see what the answers are. Uh, I think how, so. How we're gonna well, do I, it, that's a work in progress. I also well, think I'm, I'm, that, that sometimes the small group discussion, the deeper dive um, is a great tool after the big qualitative study to, to get that qualitative data and then to drive down deeper with small group discussion um, to, to get a better handle on what the issues were. Because if you've got, you know, if you're limited to 250 words or something, it, it may not all get 
well communicated in the in the survey vehicle. But I think it's also really, really important that all school board members feel heard. And the best way to do that is to to do something a little uh, mm -hmm. less, a, a little thinner on the engagement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just another thought to put out there, um, I agree, you know, broad reach when you can, um, perhaps a, you know, real focus form and invite people to an intentional meeting. And this is what we want to get out of the meeting. But right, I, I could see that as a follow-up vehicle. Thank you. Any other questions for this committee? Um, I Kim, I was just thinking um, <clears throat> physical paper copies along the same lines of Colleen's question um, is we do our meeting evaluation via a Google survey at the end of every meeting. Um, and so I don't I don't know if there's a way to send to board chairs the survey we might like people to do and see if they would incorporate five minutes in a meeting or again i think short survey would be a, a vote that i would also encourage versus something that we imagine might take too long for them to do it right well either right while we're there or if they you know needed to a lot more than 10 or 15 minutes on an agenda it may not get the attention but maybe chairs would be willing to be a vehicle for completion right in the meeting and maybe there's a way to check with chairs to see if their board uses some sort of you know online surveying tool or if they would prefer we send them the forms to be completed and and returned right to the chair for instance so that it gets back to you I worry if we wait and have them send something to us, we have the same problem that we won't get it back. Thanks, Kim. Welcome. Any other uh, comments or feedback for the member engagement committee? Nope. Uh, thanks for getting together, committee. I appreciate the work that you're doing, and uh, good luck with the next meeting. Thank you. Um, moving on then to our next item, which is the upcoming um, board retreat. Um, so I had a chance to talk with Sue. Um, we reviewed the bylaws um, for board members that are new or for those that haven't gone through this before. We typically, in the month of June, um, hold our annual board retreat. Um, last year when we held it, uh, there was a focus on renewing the strategic plan for the organization. Um, so this year, we began the discussions to figure out uh, what topic items we wanted to cover in um, this year's board retreat, but then also presented with the very challenging circumstance here that if we do the board retreat in June, it's going to have to be via the same vehicle that we're having this current meeting. Um, and after some discussion with Sue, um, we're not convinced that that's a, a great way to hold a board retreat. Um, so the proposal that we'd like to push out there is that um, we postpone um, the retreat, not to cancel it completely, but to push it off until later in the year. Um, I'm suggesting right now perhaps uh, looking towards um, August or the end of August, um, knowing that it's still a pretty fluid situation and that may change. Um, but I just didn't see it being a very efficient um, way for all of us to get together to be able to accomplish something. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I do find to some extent that these video meetings can be a bit tedious. Um, and I think, uh, you know, to try to do an entire retreat that way um, could be even more challenging. Um, so what I'd like to propose, see if we can get a head nod from board members, is that we um, postpone this for a tentative uh, date sometime in August. Um, and then at our June meeting, so what we, we would typically would have had a regular board meeting in June. Um, tacked on to the retreat. I'm going to suggest that for June we just have another regular board meeting um, and that at that meeting what we will do is uh, entertain um, potential topics uh, for a retreat that could happen sometime in August or later in the year. Um, any board members uh, vehemently opposed to the idea? 
All right. Any comments that anybody would like to share related to that thought? Go ahead, Colleen. So our, our board is struggling like with the uh, annual retreat, just like everybody else. And one of the things that we've decided to do is um, chunk out a few topics and spread them out over weeks. So, you know, maybe every other week, we haven't finalized it yet. We're just still brainstorming. But if there's a topic that we feel that we need to address, that a meeting is just on that one topic and the meeting is hour, hour and a half, no longer than two hours, and it's just that, and then two weeks later or whatever. But instead of trying to do a full day retreat, what are the key topics and just spread it out over time, months? Just a thought. Thanks, that's a good idea. Uh, Mark? Yeah, not to throw any cold water on the idea. Um, I don't think that getting together in groups is going to be possible in August um, or advisable, um, even if it is possible um, for you know people that have pre-existing conditions, things along those lines. Um, so I just, I would consider that when deciding what to do. Um, I think we're looking at, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say how long, but I think we're looking at much longer than, than August before we can actually get together. Yep. Uh, and I don't necessarily disagree with you. I was just hoping to maybe buy ourselves a little bit of time um, and maybe perhaps get some slight um, clarity in what we may be able to do or not able to do. Um, and then try to figure out uh, how best to apply that then to a need for the organization to to have a retreat. Um, I did uh, work with Sue earlier today. We we did double check in the bylaws. My reading of the bylaws um, suggests that the organization is required or ought to have a retreat. Um, so we're going to see if we can figure out a way to make it happen, um, but maybe giving us a little bit of time and in, uh, in pushing this off until August or later in the year. Um, gives us the, the planning time that we need in order to see if we can figure out the most efficient way of doing that. Neil, uh, this is Clarence. I was thinking earlier today, because I knew the retreat was tech probably coming up, that I didn't know what we'd figured out for venue and all that other stuff, but I was thinking if we went back to uh, the headquarters in Berlin down there where we've had it, by default, um, I thought we could, uh, with this size group, we could probably in this in the tables that they have there, we could maintain the social distance. If you put two or three people at every table and use the whole room, we could actually maintain the dis distances that they're asking for. The only thing we we'd have a larger group, but I think that's going to be permitted. I, I agree that we may have a problem in that uh, some of us with compromise with already pre-existing conditions are are going to have to uh, weigh that format, you know, but uh, we normally don't meet in July if I remember correctly, right? Because that's when the resolutions committee meets. That is that is correct. Um, and to your point, Clarence, we actually did reach out to. Um, so what Clarence is referencing is that in the, over the past couple of years, we've actually used uh, a large conference room at the Visbit offices in Berlin. Yeah. Um, and I know Carrie did reach out to them um, to check to see if that room would still be available. And while uh, it is available to us for rental, um, it is closed actually um, through August. Um, and I believe that at this point in time, the earliest option they're looking at of possibly making it available to other organizations would be October. So um, might be an option, but it certainly isn't an option um, over the summer months. I have a thought, um, this is Amy, that if we are supposed to only be in smaller groups, that may be on a somewhat regional basis. A few of us could meet and then there would be, we would all, there would be a group in the South, a group in the East, what, you know, whatever, as, as far as 
four or five people could get together. And then that group, all the groups would meet together through GoToMeeting maybe. And we could all be together and have the big topic discussion and then go to our individual groups and then meet up again and go to meeting. No, uh, thank you for that suggestion. Um, certainly something to look at. Um, I think what I want to make sure that, that we that we definitely do. So no matter how we decide to uh, tackle the retreat, I want to make sure that it's done in a way that um, uh, everybody feels safe in participating in the retreat, and that we don't put anybody into a position where they feel like they need to make a a, a decision um, that compromises their own. Um, healthcare concerns. So we'll make sure that we do it in a way that um, is inclusive of everyone, um, so that everyone is able to uh, participate if they if they uh, want to and if they're available. And um, if you have particular thoughts about retreat topics, um, make sure that you're thinking about those. And uh, certainly, let me or Sue know uh, between now and June, uh, or at the very least, um, bring those ideas with you to the June meeting. Um, so that we can uh, put them on the table for possible discussion. Lawrence, could you please mute your microphone? It's uh, interfering. All right. Um, any other uh, items to talk about related to the retreat? Seeing none, um, then I would like to move on to the strategic plan monitoring report. I don't know, Sue or members of uh, the staff, was there anything you'd like to particularly highlight uh, in the monitoring report, or is this uh, uh, just an opportunity if board members have any questions on the items that they saw there? I could highlight a couple of things, Neil. Um, I'd just like to highlight the the webinars that we've been holding. We've been holding, I think, more than than usual, and we've been getting better participation than usual because everyone's at home. So um, I already talked about the special webinar that we held, how we're doing what we're doing. That was on April 30th with the panel of three board chairs and three superintendents. We had um, 87 people register for that and 63 attended live. So that was a new VSBA record. And then um, in April, Susan did a uh, welcome to school board service that was pre-recorded as a video to ensure that new members had timely access to the information and could um, look at it when, based on their own schedule. And then just uh, last week, I did an open meeting law webinar with the Deputy Secretary of State, Chris Winters, and um, I thought it went really well. There were a lot of questions uh, and and they were all answered. So the webinar went a little bit longer than we had planned, but I don't think anyone minded because they got all of their questions answered. And if you weren't able to attend that webinar and you would like a little refresher on the open meeting law, I would definitely recommend it. It was great to have the Deputy Secretary of State with us. And it had executive session information on it as well, which I know a lot of board members have been using just since then. Yes. Uh, Sue, is it appropriate to ask you about anything new with the um, arbitration uh, and um, and negotiations or negotiations in general? Sure, you could. I, I could provide you with a update. You should have received an email from me recently. Since the arbitration award and statewide bargaining was announced last December, school boards and local union negotiators have been um, grappling with how to incorporate the award into their collective bargaining agreements. And there have been ongoing discussions since December between the employer and the employee representatives for the Commission um, on Public School Employee Health Benefits regarding a written document that would reflect the terms and conditions for health insurance benefits as required by the arbitration award. And um, just in the last week or so, a final document detailing those terms and conditions was agreed to by the parties. Um, that was in early May, that was agreed to between the um, employer commissioners and the employee commissioners. And when that um, 
was agreed to, the VSBA sent a, that document to all school board members and encouraged them to consult with their school attorney on the best approach to incorporate the arbitration award into their collective bargaining agreements. Um, can, I, can I just so ask one, about that? Excuse me? Can I just ask about that? Uh, uh, why sure. wouldn't this be a statewide introduction and not a district uh, use your own attorney to under, to 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 best um, bring it into the negotiations? Because boards are looking at how to incorporate that into their local collective bargaining agreements. And so um, the issue is whether you're going to use it as an appendix or whether you're just going to reference it. And it, I'm, it depends on how your local agreement is structured. Okay. Uh, what's going on with negotiations? Are, are people continue to negotiate through this, or I know we've stopped. Uh, I the VSA sent out a survey at the end of April, um, and it looked like there were only about 15% of districts that had completed their negotiations and ratified, um, and so there were 85% that were still negotiating. I don't have a good sense of whether they're all continuing to negotiate um, during during this uh, pandemic over Zoom or some other platform. I think some of them are. Um, I think a lot of them are not. Um, this is. Can I just say something? Yep. Who? Uh, Adrian, go ahead. Um, I know in our district. <laughs> I know in our district, um, we were given the word by our um, association that the NEA has advised that that people hold off until they know how much of the federal money will be available. They did not want to settle for something. As they put it, they did not want to agree to something that was less advantageous than than it might be. So we're on hold. And I think that's pretty widespread. Kim, did you have something to add? I was just going to say we are also on hold. And at, despite a very good relationship with our union, we did also receive notification of the um, sort of intent to potentially um, reopen negotiation of the current contract to bargain the conditions for work during COVID-19. So they didn't say there was anything in particular right now, but that they felt they had to state that um, intention to view it such that it could be negotiated. And I think we've had legal opinion that it would not be a be covered under some clause. I don't have it in front of me immediately. Um, so we are agreeing to disagree basically is what the um, the, outcome of that was because we're not doing any bargaining right now and nor have they come back with any particular issue that they're interested in having addressed with respect to the work um, place or conditions right now while we are rounding out this um, collective bargaining agreement and are um, closing out the remote school year so just i don't know if others had gotten it when we got the first notice of that, it seemed very canned, like it would have come from Vermont NEA, um, sort of opened with you know, the paragraph that sounded more like our um, association leaders, and then the middle sounded Vermont NEA, and it, as sort of a, a formal notice versus anything particular. And then as we responded that we were running it by our attorney and that we felt we would not be obliged to do so. Um, they came back with their, the Vermont NEA's opinion on the topic. And again, there's nothing particular, so it's not contentious really, except that we are in disagreement about interpretation. We, okay. we received something and actually, I think it had very similar language, you know, it was reserving the right is the way they put it, but Dave, David may know more. Um, well, I, I don't know all the details of what the most recent thing is, but, but we had achieved a, a number of tentative agreements 
and had made a, a solid offer before we we got hit by the uh, by the lockdown. And so um, we do have a scheduled meeting, and uh, and my sense is that is that they've agreed that they do want to meet. So I had the sense I thought, unless they've been told otherwise, and maybe Jim knows more about that, but I thought that they were inclined to try to get to an agreement. So I would find I I find the next meeting for us very interesting because we do have a. a a pretty good offer on the table that will be appealing to them in some ways and unappealing in others, and it's a take it all, take it or leave it. It's a it's it's a it's a complete package. We told them that they couldn't parse it for the parts that they liked and and uh, omit the parts that they didn't like. So, but we think it's a pretty solid package. So we're hoping that they'll take it. We'll see what happens. Uh, and how this uh, other advice that they received, how that affects the, our negotiations. Yeah, I think I, I think you know. I after I heard that other people were receiving it, I checked with our superintendent, who said, <clears throat> "Yes, here's the notice we received," and it looked like a can notice that and was presented as it's a placeholder. So I think it 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 was actually totally. That came in, David's been doing the negotiations, and th those are like two totally separate things. The, you know, we're, we're reserving the right to, to object, and, but we're going ahead and negotiating in good faith otherwise. All right, any other uh, folks wanna chime in on the negotiations topic? Certainly an important one for most all of us. Okay. Um, seeing none then, if there are no other further questions on the uh, strategic plan monitoring report, um, then I do want to move along to an item um, related to a perceived um, conflict of interest regarding member services for uh, one of our board members. Um, uh, folks should have received an email um, from me through uh, Carrie yesterday that included some additional information for, for the discussion. Um, I would like to move this though into executive session. Um, and uh, I've uh, provided a motion uh, for that to Jim. Um, so Jim, would you mind uh, making that motion? Sure, I'd just like to make a motion to enter executive session for a discussion regarding VSBA board member conflict of interest. Okay, do we have a second for that motion? I'll second, Adrian. I'll second that. Okay. So a motion made by Jim Salzgiver, seconded by Adrian. Is there any discussion? Um, uh, the one thing that I do want to clarify is whether board members would like any um, staff, any VSBA staff to attend uh, the executive session. I feel as though it would be helpful um, to have Sue join us. Uh, um, I was going to make that point. Okay. Turning the um, recording off so we, now. Yep. So we have a motion on the table. It has been seconded. We've had some discussion. Uh, the one thing that I will add, and this was after discussion with Don, um, and and certainly um, would meet sort of the board criteria, is that um, if the board does decide to make a decision related to this, um, that we will be doing that in a public session. Um, when we come back out of the executive session. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, thanks everybody. We are back in public session now. Uh, and the next item up on the agenda is our consent agenda. Um, and so if a board member would be willing to make a motion, I would love to take it. I'll make Neil, a motion. I would Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, sorry. I, I would just add that um, it would be the April minutes and the minutes from last Friday. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so our, our special meeting for related to the PPP from last week. I'll move to a, uh, approve the two sets of minutes in the con and the consent agenda. This is Clarence. This is Dan. I'll second that. Thank you, Dan. Any discussion? 
Seeing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda passes. Um, are there any uh, new business items to bring up at this point? Any agenda items that board members would like to see for a future agenda? And if you don't have any now, feel free to reach out to me over the next month. Neil, this All is right. more of just a report, but did you want to mention the appointment of Zach McLaughlin to the oh, high board by yes, the yes. executive committee? Yes, sorry, thank you, Kim. Um, so for those members that may have been aware or may not, um, we did have a vacancy on the uh, VHI Board of Directors. We had um, a departure of a school board member uh, a few months ago, I believe. Um, we found a replacement for him, Zach McLaughlin, superintendent from, help me out, Sue. Springfield. Springfield, Springfield. thank you. Um, and uh, Zach uh, had agreed to uh, um, serve in that position, so the executive committee met um, and under uh, our authority um, approved his appointment to the VHI Board of Directors. Um, everybody should send him a thank you note because this is not an easy position. Um, he will be uh, working hard for the money that he gets from serving in that slot. Anything else that I'm missing, Sue? I don't think you're missing anything. Just for any new board members, the um, VSBA board uh, has voted to authorize the executive committee to make the appointments to the VHI board. And there's information on the uh, our website about that. So do we have another vacancy coming up on that board? Sure, do we have another vacancy? Yes, there will be another vacancy uh, probably in June or July. There will be a vacancy because um, one of the uh, one of the members that we appointed is moving away from the state of Vermont. So he, he will be leaving the board. All right. So if there are no other new business items, um, I apologize for going 16 minutes over our allotted end time. But thank you again, board, for uh, participating in this um, remote VSBA board meeting. Um, I hope you all remain healthy and well. Um, and with that, I will look for a motion to adjourn. I move the meeting be adjourned. This is Clarence.